September 2007, the detectives get an order for exhumation of husband number one, Michael Wallace. Michael Wallace's body would be exhumed and autopsied. And I was standing there saying, boy, I hope if he was killed, this comes out. I hope there's something there. So suddenly you have this dramatic scene playing out in this cemetery. They are digging up the body of Michael Wallace, who is buried right next to the second husband, David Castor. And they're exhuming the body because they want to know, will it reveal anything more about how he might have died? A few days later, I was walking through the Criminal Investigations Division when I received a phone call from the medical examiner. Then he said, hey, uh, we just got done with the autopsy. I have the results for you. And he said, guess what I found? He's loaded with crystals. When you are poisoned with antifreeze, crystals form in your organs, and they don't ever go away. And that was one of the reasons why we exhumed him, was so that we could find out if those crystals were still there. So when you do an autopsy on someone who ingested antifreeze, you can see the slides of the various organs. It looks like a gold vein in a Western mine somewhere. You see these little beautiful crystals popping up at you. Those telltale crystals, the same crystals when you look side by side with David Castor from the antifreeze. So that was like a big, yeah, we got her. Awesome. I knew at that point we had a double homicide. And Stacey Castor probably killed both her husbands. And really, it's that moment that this investigation breaks wide open. That's when we said, we need to bring it here for a second interview. A detective Spinelli and I drove out to speak to Stacy. He explained to her that, you know, he hadn't closed out the investigation yet. I told her that we needed to close the case out one way or the other, and I need to have some questions answered. She seemed nervous. She was pacing, and she just was surprised that we were there. She thought this was all over and done with. She made mention that it was like him coming from the grave, like his hand was reaching out from the grave. I remember even shooting a look at Detective Spinelli because I thought it was just an odd thing for someone to say. Your husband has died of a suicide. Why would he be control controlling you in any way? At our sheriff's headquarters building, we have four interview rooms. Spinelli set up one of the rooms, brought Stacy into that room. I said, uh, Stacy, there were two glasses sitting on the nightstand. You say that you poured him some cranberry juice at one point, right? She said, yes. And I said, I'm going to show you a picture of those two glasses. I asked Stacy, do you remember which glass it was that you poured the cranberry juice in? And she looked at it and said, well, when I poured the antifree, I, uh, and then she stopped and said, I mean, I mean the cranberry juice. Like, like she realizes what she's just said. She actually had a Freudian slip. She said, when I was pouring the antifree, I mean the cranberry juice. She said it all right there. And I looked at her and said, but you said antifree. And she said, you know, I don't like this. You're trying to frame me. You're trying to pin this on me. And uh, I'm done. And she stopped the interview. And she just said, that's it. I'm done. I want an attorney. As I picked up my folder to put the picture back in it, it just so happened that the top picture was a picture of the turkey baster. Stacy peered at the folder and said, what, what is that? And I said, what? And she said, that picture. What is that picture of a turkey baster? Why is that there? And I said, don't worry about it. The interview's over. After police had questioned Stacy Castor, she actually went to her daughters and said, girls, the cops think I killed David. I was like, that can't be right. You couldn't have murdered him because they issued death certificates saying that he died of suicide. And she said? And she said, I know. I didn't do this. It was apparent that Stacy was extremely nervous after my interview with her. We decided the next step would be to obtain a wiretap on Stacy's phones. And it scares the living out of me because I didn't do this. Stacy, in that week, making a lot of calls. She was in distress. They think I did this. They put up cameras outside her house so they can tell her comings and goings. They have a camera at the cemetery to see if Stacy's ever visiting their grave sites. She hears that her first husband's body has been exhumed. She wants to go see it for herself, so she goes to the burial site. 
sees that it's true, his body has been exhumed. She called someone up on the phone who was quite upset that we had exhumed Michael's body. And I don't believe for one second that they found antifreeze on Michael's body. I don't believe it. I recall Stacy saying something along the lines of, they did it, they actually did it, they exhumed them, they, they did it. why they do that? She tells me, they exhumed your father's body. And I didn't believe it, so I went out and checked. I started crying. I got upset, like, he was resting peacefully and they just dug him up. Why would they dig up daddy? I thought it was inhumane and I didn't like it whatsoever. Ashley has just graduated from high school and she's just entering college when she gets this news. I was at school on Wednesday, my first day of college. I'm all excited. Two investigators show up and deliver her the news that her father didn't die of a heart attack. He died of antifreeze poisoning. I was like, then you're, you're lying because I knew that my dad had a heart attack. That's how it was. He had a heart attack. I left and went and called my mom. Hello? Mommy, they came to my freaking school. They came to your school? Are you OK? Um, I'm going to be OK, but I'm really freaking out right now. She is in disbelief, first of all, that her father didn't die of that heart attack, that he was murdered, uh, that they come to her school and they've revealed this to her. And you can hear it in her voice as she's talking to her mother. I don't understand how they know I was even going to be here. Oh, my God. That bastard came to your school. And you can hear it in her mother's voice, too, this disbelief that they've come to the school and that they've told her daughter this. And then Stacy Castor, the mom, has this suggestion. You know what? This is all too heavy. Why don't we drink? Why don't we have a drink? It's just been a rough week. It's been really horrible for us with everything going on. Let's just drink. Had you ever done that before? Not once. And she says, We've had a rough week. Let's just get drunk. And you thought? I was like, cool, you know? What kind of teenager wouldn't think that was awesome? My parents just gave you permission to drink. Sweet. Stacy mixes this, uh, you know, probably 12 ounce plastic cup. Ashley you know, caught up in the moment. This is so cool, this is neat. I, I wanna make my mom happy. She drinks it and uh, becomes, you know, lethargic and eventually passes out and winds up in her bedroom. She wakes up, got a little hangover, goes back to school, comes back. Mom again says, let's drink, but this time let's get really drunk. And this time, Ashley says, Mom, it's not even noon yet. And she says, oh, you know, it'll be noon by the time we're drinking. But this wasn't just a second day of mother and daughter drinking. This was actually the scene that would now lead to the second phone call to 911 from Stacy Castor about an emergency playing out in her home. Another family member near death, this time her daughter, Ashley. I need an ambulance at Russell Road. She's having trouble, I think. It sounds like there's something in her throat. Ashley. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. This is not happening. 